I'm recording. All right. Sal's going to teach us some stuff about mutations today. Yes. One way to understand this is as it relates to examining evolution and the problems with evolution. If, if let's say half of the uh, mutations resulted in some sort of functional improvement, then uh, it'd be much easier to evolve complexity because then you could eliminate the bad and, and you end up with something good. So it's like, yeah, that would work really well. And this can be, I suppose, can be modeled uh, computationally or whatever. It's a different story that when practically every mutation is either going to be hopefully not damaging or damaging, there are situations where practically speaking, uh, single isolated mutations would just result in damage without a whole bunch of simultaneous changes. Uh, it's just going to be damaging. And uh, rather than talk about this abstractly, one good way to illustrate this is with ion channels. And uh, Rebecca, do you have any? Do you want me to you, bring up the ion channel video? But, but, but before we go there, I, I'm presuming you've not, you've not really encountered this until today. No. Okay, so in a lot of the evolutionary discussions, Obviously, these things are not talk, talked about. When we hear about uh, the promotion for evolution, they'll talk about the similarity of chimps and humans. So there are two components of evolution. There are probably more than one, two components, but there are two major ones. One is the claim of universal common ancestry. And in today's discussion, we'll just assume that that's true. But universal common ancestry does not explain the evolution of complexity and then it doesn't really deal with, uh, you know, how, how difficult is it to make a, uh, a functional improvement? So there, there are scientists like Michael Behe and Michael Denton that accept universal common ancestry as a given, but they say that um, the theory of evolution still is not complete until you can explain the evolution of complexity. And to, to today's segment is dealing with something related to that, to that, namely the the problem of isolated mutations, uncoordinated mutations, a mutation here or there, can it build something complex? And I'm going to show some illustrations where it's it's going to be, I think, fairly obvious. You can't do you can't do mutations piecemeal. For a new feature, a, a, a substantially new improvement to like say some of these ion channels to happen, it have to have many coordinated changes at the same time. Otherwise, it's going to be damaging. Random changes would be just devastating. And um, so do you have any questions so far? No. All right. And this will also lead to uh, a topic where I published on uh, with some very senior scientists who are obviously friendly to my position. Uh, two of the scientists in this recent publication have not openly said whether they're ID proponents or creationists or whatever, and I'm going to respect that. But uh, they obviously felt comfortable having me as their co-author in a paper on dynamical systems uh, and fitness maximization. Uh, and it was published by Springer, Springer Nature. So that was a big deal for us. And in the process, we, we criticized the evolutionary definition of fitness because if we define fitness purely in reproductive success, you get kind of some ridiculous conceptions of what fitness is. You could say that um, uh, the feature of not being so smart can actually be a beneficial trait. And um, that, can, that, that leads to some absurdities of what the trajectory of evolution would be. Whereas if we define things in more uh, teleological uh, terms where there's an idea of function, there's an idea of uh, optimality in terms of an engineering or medical principle. Uh, it, it turns this, uh, it, you know, it turns all this around the way evolutionary biologists normally treat it. 
because then we don't define fitness in terms of reproductive success, but rather functional capability. So, um, okay. One question I guess that comes up is um, you mentioned that, you know, there are some that will accept universal common ancestry, um, but you don't, just for the record, you're not saying that we should accept universal common ancestry. Correct. And, and so we do this in mathematics. It's called an argument by contradiction. Mm -hmm. It's like you accept the premise you're actually trying to refute as just as a, for the sake of argument. And as you accept that premise, just for the sake of argument, and at least an absurdity, you know that the premise is false. And in this case, it's a little more subtle than that. We can accept it just on the on 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 the basis for the sake of argument, because what's on the table today is not the question of whether uh, we all descended from one universal common ancestor. the The issue is even assuming that does that would that explain how complexity, like say the complexity of the eye, the the complexity of the nervous system, and the, they're just features that are just incredible that to this day surpass technologies uh, collectively of all the scientists and engineers on the planet. I recently talked to a, a scientist who will not be named. He's a physicist. He's very close to retirement and maybe he can be more open. But we were talking, he said, the capabilities of some of these systems, he said, you could take all the scientists and engineers on the planet. We could not build it. If you just gave us the specifications of some of these systems, and he said, okay, have at it. We could not build it. It is that sophisticated. We can, you know, the irony is we can send people to the moon. We can build these space stations. We can build these space probes. We can build all these computers. But there are some things in biology that uh, kind of embarrass, would make us look like just um, um, toy manufacturers by comparison to the sophistication we see. And ion channels, which will... I hope to talk about today uh, our example of some really spectacular sophistication. So let me <clears throat> let me try to describe an ion channel. I don't have a uh, a graph handy. Uh, an ion is a a molecular atom that has has a charge to it, either positive or negative, and th the cell. Uh, the cell or a membrane will pass. Okay, so th the cell has a membrane, and in case of eukaryotes, it has lots of membranes even inside of it. So you have all these compartments. And these ions can go in and out, but they have to be uh, done in a controlled way. Our nervous system would fail without these ion channels. So just look at it like a gatekeeper. Ion channels are like a gate gatekeeper. It's going to only allow certain things in or out under specific conditions and how uh and, and that's basically it so you know the just look at it as a gatekeeper uh through a membrane and various cells have have ion channels uh in their membranes and this is really uh, very prominent in eukaryotes that have membranes on the outside and then all these little compartments on the inside so uh do you have any comments before i go on I need a visual. All right. Let's see if I can find a... While I'm trying to gin one up here, do um, you have any thoughts? I'm just waiting to hear more. All righty. I'm going to try to bring a visual up. Oh, there is a Wikipedia entry on ion channels. So let's uh, let me see if I can find one that looks really nice. Let's see if I could find one. Oh, here, here, here's one I could use. Can you uh, sh show that? I got it up now. There it is. Ion channel. Okay. So you could see here the, these little bars here. That those are that's what we call a lipid bilayer. Mm -hmm. um, fats are lipids, and these are what they call phospholipids here. 
and by the way, any biologist, if I say something wrong, please feel to, free to correct the basic biology. Um, but anyway, so this is a channel here, and it's so. So the, the this part here is this representing the cell membrane. If you could see that with my mouse cursor. And this part here is the protein or a protein complex that constitutes the, the channel. So the membrane is made of lipids and the protein is made of amino acids. So this is a really cool chemical arrangement. And so um, when it says Na here, that's a sodium ion and, and it can go and it goes you know, it can enter here and then come out there. There are other channels like the potassium channel here where it's always open or closed. And depending on the concentration, uh, basically the conditions um, on one side of the membrane or other, it's gonna, it's gonna move these ions through. And it's very clever how this is utilized. So, so is it like if the cell doesn't need that chemical, it will close it? Essentially, yes. Okay. So, and it's been a while since I've studied, uh, had a class in neuroscience. But basically when you're thinking and when you're feeling and you're sensing, even when your eyes are working, so to speak, there are all these movements of ions to be able to transmit information. And so the movement of the, the potassium and the sodium through these channels enables you to have so many things, so many of the things that define what it is to be human. See, bacteria don't have nerve cells. They don't, whereas, you know, you, you touch something and it, it sends a signal through all the nerves and it's just a cascade. It's going to be moving these, these uh, ions back and forth in and out of the cells. So it's just, as it's exchanging stuff, it's able to do this and there, there are diagrams of how this works in the nervous system. And we're going to study today, we'll see a video, the always open channel, specifically this potassium ion channel, but there are other kinds of channels where um, the conditions you're saying, like, can, can it, uh, um, can the cell adjust depending on the conditions to let things are in or out. So in these channels that are op always open, the gate is always open, but there might be other conditions that will prevent the flow um, in terms of um, uh, for lack of a better word, like osmosis or other sorts of properties. It, it's kind of complicated. I don't know it off the top of my head, but there are situations where you can actually physically close the channel. So you have these mechanically gated channels some mechanical thing will happen and the, the channel will close. The ones that are really interesting are these voltage gated channels. These, these are like almost, um, there are things in electrical engineering and you could take this down briefly. Um, there are things in electrical engineering that are akin to that, where we have voltage gated transistors and it, basically can be like a logic gate. Now, one of my professors in, in neuroscience, he was not a biologist to begin with. He had a PhD in electrical engineering. So why did the NIH hire him? It's because they needed engineering principles to understand how, because ions are charged particles. So there's kind of like an electrical, there's definitely an electrical component there. They needed an electrical engineer to understand he could describe this in terms of electrical engineering principles and the way electrical engineering systems work to be able to process signals and information. That's the mindset they needed. And I'm sorry to say this, I'll try to be polite. That's why they hired him rather than an evolutionary biologist, because that's a skill set that's needed. And that's something that I'm seeing across more and more of these research teams. They're hiring engineers, computational scientists, physicists, chemists. The one skill set that's not very helpful is <laughs> evolutionary biology. So now, why do you think that is? Why is evolutionary biology not helpful? 
Well, well, it's it's not too far from. Why would you hire an evolutionary biologist to figure out your car? You need someone that understands mechanical principles. A lot of the cell is mechanical principles, and then you would need someone with a background in chemistry to understand the chemical reaction interactions. Someone that can say, "Oh, look, our genes are so similar to the chimpanzees, and then the chimpanzees similar to this, and building these family trees." You can almost do that with a computer program now. It's just not a skill set that will help you understand how things work. Understanding how the reason there's interest in this is when we have diseases, we have to try to figure out what's causing the disease, and maybe we can figure out ways to alleviate the symptoms and hopefully even find cures. So being able to build family trees of how this evolved from that is just not helpful to these questions. And so in the biotechnology and medical field, there's sometimes a little bit of a collision between the evolutionary biologists and these practitioners, because especially they, uh, in the medical field that gets uh, imports some of the engineers in there, we use very teleological language. And evolutionary biologists do not like that. When we'll say this is designed to do this, this is designed to do that, which suggests foresight. And and uh, they prefer to, to frame, they prefer to frame biology in terms of reproductive success, not teleological function. And it's an uncomfortable relationship. It was really, it's really kind of comical we've seen evolutionary biologists try to go and, and try to um, say, it's just not politically correct. Let's try to eliminate any sort of language that describes biology in terms of function or purpose. Because if you say function, there's there's kind of the hint of like uh, a pre-planned purpose. It's just a little bit too, you know, it's a little bit too close to uh, what they don't want. And, but then, like I said, my professor of neuroscience is an electrical engineer. That's all about building things for a predefined purpose, something you had foresight and planning to construct because that's what drives the design and the architecture. And so when we look at biology as uh, the various parts of it as being constructed in a way that fulfills a purpose, that, that starts to you know go into uncomfortable territory. Um, without being too overt, even then it's just a little bit too close to home, so to speak, of what they want to avoid talking about. Because if something is engineered, it needs an engineer, right? Yes. If some, <laughs> so if, you, if you've got something that looks like it's engineered and that you have to deal with as something that is a design, an engine, you know, with a specific purpose, then you have to like acknowledge that there is a force or someone and who designed. Exactly. So this is starting to hit home as, as to what will be the more effective science. So, I, I mean, I, you know, um, on, on some other shows, guys were saying evolutionary biology is the central to science year or biology. And just like, where do I see it? Cause I certainly don't see it in the research teams. Um, I mean, why would they, why would they hire an electrical engineering PhD rather than an evolutionary biologist? That electrical engineering PhD had no biology, biology background when he got hired by the National Institutes of Health. It's because he had the right skill sets in terms of recognizing, oh, this part does that, this part does that. This is very similar to the way we do it in electrical engineering. That therefore predicts there has to be another part that'll have to do this. And we have to look for that part. So, I mean, I talked to this professor and I, I asked him, I said, uh, what did they hire you for specifically? He said, I was studying the ear. And my jaw dropped. I said, that's incredible. So I, I said, you know, I mean, this was essentially our conversation. I said, you know, the ear has to do like these fast Fourier, the equivalent of fast Fourier transforms. And that was a miserable class in digital signal processing. Um, it has to do these Fourier transforms, do signal transduction. It has to do all sorts of amplification and filtering. He said, oh, yeah. He said, it's just crazy how it does this. And 
I said, you know, when I was studying this, I asked around, I said, can we build anything that can do what the human ear and audio system can do? He said, and I quickly realized we couldn't, and not for a very, very long time, he agreed with me. He said, he said, we don't even know the fraction of how all this works. It's so amazing. And that's from a PhD electrical engineering. Because a lot of electrical engineering in the earlier years um, was was dealing with audio systems. And we just take it for granted when we have a microphone and a speaker that, oh, that's trivial. It's like, <laughs> if you're an electrical engineer, it is not trivial to build something that can process sound that you could send it through a wire and then reconstruct it. But it's very similar process when uh, we're hearing something is going to get processed. And like in the case of some birds or like um, these people that are very good at doing imitations, they can imitate someone else's voice and all their mannerisms. I said, you try to get a mechanical system that can do that that well, uh, you know, short of building a recorder. The engineers understand all the difficulty in doing that. And so the part of that process involves these ion channels. So why don't I, I'm going to read something before I move on to reading this, uh, if you have any comments. Well, you're, what you're are, muted. Sorry, I'm muted. No, this is great. What What are we looking at here? Okay, just to underscore the importance of the ion channels, let's talk about what happens when we mutate ion channels. And this is from a paper, and there's the title, Ion Channels Related Diseases. So we hear a lot of talk about beneficial mutations causing evolution. So is this kind of an example of mutations that don't benefit yes and i'm going to argue that most mutations that are isolated meaning if we do it one at a time it's going to be a disaster uh, it'll either be neutral at best or detrimental and we can show that geometrically that's why i like the ion channel you can really see that you can kind of i'll show this more visually why because you're not going to get a situation where you get a mutation and half the time it's good and half the time it's bad. It's going to be in the case if they're isolated mutations and they're not happening, a whole bunch of them happening simultaneously, the tendency is that they're either going to be neutral to bad, which effectively saying it's never going to be good. Practically speaking, I mean, of course, there are exceptions, but practically speaking, it's going to be rare. And and the reason I covered the ion channels, I'll show some videos, I'll show some pictorial things. You can actually see visually the reason why. Rather than appealing to theoretical papers, you could see it visually. But first, let us let me just read the abstract about what happens when ion channels are mutated. There are many diseases related to ion channels. Mutations in muscle voltage-gated sodium, potassium, calcium, and chlorine channels and acetylcholine gated channel may lead to such physiological disorders as hyper and hypokalemic periodic paralysis, myotonias, long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, malignant hyperthermia and myasthenia, neuronal, neuronal disorders, epilepsy, episodic ataxia, familiar hemi <laughs> hemiplegic migraine, Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, hyperreplexia, and, and may result from this uh, may result from the dysfunction of voltage gated sodium, potassium, ca and calcium channels, or acetylcholine and glycine gated channels, some kidney disorders, uh, Barter's syndrome, polycystic kidney disease, and dense disease, secretion disorders, hyperinsulinic hypoglycemia of infancy and, and cystic fibrosis, vision dis disorders, e.g. congenital stationary night blindness and total clutter blindness may also be linked to mutations in ion channels. I <laughs> mean, uh, you could take this down now. Um, Do we have any examples of good mutations that happen in ion channels? Not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I'll... And when we watch this next video, I think we'll see why. 
it's not that you can't take a basic ion channel and improve upon it, but the improvements have to be s simultaneous. Uh, there's a saying, what good is half a wing? That was by Stephen Jay Gould. But at the molecular level, you really see it, unless sometimes you have a major overhaul. Um, it's not going to work. So it's like if you've seen some of these stretch limousines, what they have to do is cut the car in half and then um, add the stuff in the middle. Uh, it, <laughs> Then you have a functioning, but you have to, you know, you have to, you have to stop the process for a while, and uh, you know, it can't be drivable for a long time until you're done rebuilding it. You can't just take a screwdriver and start, you know, like you can't take the car and cut it in half, and then it's functional. It's just mm -hmm. not going to work that way. It, it, essentially, it has to be totally overhauled. The problem with single isolated mutations is it's kind of like cutting the car in half. And then what do you do then? It's, it, you, you started out with a functioning car and now you have a dysfunctional one. So there's a saying that uh, I don't know that it's unique to Walter Brown, but I first got it in his book. He said, a, an arm will become a bad arm first before it becomes a good wing. So it's an idea. If you're going to make a stretch limousine, it's going to be a non-functioning car for a long time before it can be a functioning stretch limousine. And, and, and so, uh, yeah. back to your question, are there any, I've known an isolated mutation here or there that has caused improvement? I'd say no. And I'll defend that for ion, for certain classes of ion channels. So we'll start with a very basic um, ion channel. Now this is not exactly the one, the kind of ion channel that I just read about, but uh, you might say that if we accept common ancestry, I would say that this was the first channel. And then um, the equivalent of miraculous transformations started to modify it to be voltage gated and all these. However you want to say it, the steps had to be kind of like, you know, one day it's just the regular limousine. And then the next moment it's transformed into a stretch limousine. So uh, just, just consider this particular channel, and if you could bring that up and we'll play how this works. The bacterial potassium channel is a multi-pass transmembrane protein in the plasma membrane. It is built from four identical subunits that are arranged symmetrically. A pore in the center of the protein allows selective passage of potassium ions across the membrane. Four rigid protein loops, one contributed by each subunit, form a selectivity filter at the narrowest part of the pore. This structure is responsible for the channel's high degree of selectivity for potassium ions over sodium ions. In the selectivity filter, carbonyl groups line the walls of the pore. These carbonyl groups are spaced precisely to interact with an unsolvated potassium ion, balancing the energy required to remove its hydration shell. Passage of a sodium ion through the channel is energetically unfavorable because the sodium is too small for optimal interaction with the carbonyl groups. So in that, Sal, what happened to the sodium? It was too small. And then what happened to it? Like, you're, you're muted. You're muted. This is very interesting because normally we would think something too small would easily pass. Right? If, if we built, built a hole, it'll let something go through this, you know, not quite as big as the hole or anything smaller. You'd need a pretty clever scientist to figure that out, that it's not going to let things that are smaller. So this is very counterintuitive. Was that kind of where you were thinking? It's like, that doesn't yeah, make sense. Yeah, I was just wondering, could it pass through? 
So you're saying it can't, it does not it, pass through. It does and it not. Cannot. See, what happens in kind of what we call the macroscopic world, it's so much bigger than individual atoms. It's very different at the molecular level. So, you know, like I, I have, you know, I can drill a hole somewhere and anything smaller than that hole will get through. But in the cell, it's different. It's, it's a whole different story. And if we were doing this from scratch, you'd have to be really clever to realize that. That if you built this particular hole, things that are smaller are not actually going to pass through, which is would be a remarkable insight because that's so counter, what we call counterintuitive. It just grates against our everyday understanding of how things work. That's why I said you'd have to be really, really clever to do this. Now, let me see if I could show this. I have, this is from a PowerPoint slide. Let me, um, I'm going to try to show something here, see if I could find it. And I'll, I'll throw it up on the screen as, as soon as, yeah, why don't I? Yeah, if you can, if you could show this, this is uh, just kind of a raw PowerPoint. And let me kind of shrink this down a little bit so it's not so big. So we could see the tight fitting of the parts here of, uh, this is a man-made nut and bolt. And you could see the precision that if the nut or the bolt, so, so the, the bolt fits with that nut if if you change the size of the nut or the bolt, it's there's no way you can make it better. If you can, okay, if you make like say the bolt too small, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna uh, hold. It'll slip through or it'll be too loose. If you make it too tight, you're never gonna be able to insert it through. It has to be. There's a tolerance. There's a range of sizes that have to be met for it to work. So in a sense, if you vary it, uh, there, let, let's say hypothetically there's an optimal size. Uh, if you deviate from that, it's going to be bad. You can't improve upon the fit, in other words. If the purpose of this, again, we're going to use teleological language and functional language. If the purpose of this is to be like something to, to, to help fasten things together. It has to be about, it has to be the right size. There's an optimal size. Changing it in any way that affects the size is, is gonna be detrimental to the purpose. This will carry over to the, the ion channel. But, um, so let's just focus on the man-made side of this. I mean, can you see that? that yeah. There's like, yeah. How can you improve on that? It's like, well, okay, we could, we could, we could make all sorts of machines and all, and we, we can, we can take the metal and reform it and make something else like a, uh, you know, if we had enough, we could make a car engine. But the point is for that particular system, the parts have to be well matched together. Variation from that is damaging. And, and this carries over to so many, of the biological systems at the molecular level, it, you're either going to break it or you hope you, you don't do too much damage because you're not going to improve it. And if you could show that again, I'm going to go to the next slide. So that's so what I'm hearing is that like that list of diseases that we read off, uh, that you read off from the abstract is those are that's what happens when the ion channel mutates and so this is the example of what breaks it right like or what happens when it gets mutated it yes i mean how exactly how can you improve it how can you improve something like as basic as a nut and bolt without totally destroying it or overhauling it i mean you'd have to okay just think okay how can i improve a nut and a bolt yeah. Well, just, just, I mean, just as a kind of a, a mental exercise, how can I improve a nut and a bolt? Uh, what sort of simultaneous changes, how many simultaneous changes would I need to make to make it do a different function or improve it? Now, I'm deliberately showing a picture here. Um, we looked at that potassium ion channel. Here's uh, a different view of the potassium ion channel with uh, on the right with 
uh, a rendering of uh, what they call Richardson ribbon diagram. Now I modified it slightly. Uh, th there's some extra tails there that I clipped off, but you can see it looks a little bit like a nut with a hole through it. I don't know that, uh, correct me, uh, uh, check that. This is a particular ion channel. I don't know that it's specifically the potassium. So um, I, I just I just saw this ion channel when I was Googling images and I, it just struck me. I said, hey, that looks, look at the beautiful symmetry there. And there, there are all these aspects of symmetry. And um, you could take this down now. So, so the, the idea, the size of that hole, that channel, that tunnel, basically, if it's just an angstrom or a fractional angstrom too big, it's going to fail as a potassium ion channel. If it's it's too small, it's going to fail. It has to be just right. So that nut and bolt is kind of a good analogy in that if, if, the, if the size of the hole in the nut is too large, it's going to fail. If it's too narrow, it's going to fail too. It's a very similar thing um, with ion channels like the potassium. It has to be just the right size. And, and that nut and bolt is probably precise within maybe microns but or, or millimeters. But that ion channel has to be precise to within sub angstroms, sometimes smaller than the atomic radius, uh, you know, fractional atomic radius of those ions. I don't know that anyone knows how to engineer things with that level of precision um, without a great deal of difficulty. And so, well, you know, so yeah. when I, you know, I, I often hear the idea that, well, it wasn't perfect at the beginning. Maybe, you know, there were non-functional parts that, you know, eventually became functional or, Maybe they once, you know, there was the, there's the exaptation where it started out as something else. And then, you know, a mutation, um, you know, it, it was used as a different function until the point where it mutated to this degree. Do you think, I mean, is that a reasonable explanation? And is this with millions of years to work on this uh, with natural selection? Do you think that's something that can happen? No. And there, there are two ways to go about this. Let's try to prove it. Uh, you heard all those diseases. How about we get a cell that that needed the potassium ion channel? And why don't you rip it out? You can you can re-engineer genomes of some of these. Like we saw the the one that we showed was a bacterial. Knock it out. See if it lives. See if it's going to evolve back. I mean, wouldn't that be... That would be a scientific test of that hypothesis. And if you say it's going to, well, you have to invoke millions of years. At that point, whether it's reasonable or not, you're going into territory that's faith-based, not fact-based. And I could say, I think that's absurd. And they'll say, no, that's how it worked. And I'll say, okay, it's your word against mine. You don't have any experiments to prove it, do you? Because I could probably point to lots of experiments say like over the next hundred years, you're not going to see it get anywhere near that, assuming the cell's even alive at that point. And um, so, so, okay, so that's where I try to say is for some of us on our, you know, with my sympathies and yours, we're tempted to say, absolutely, it'll fail. That might be our opinion, but maybe the more conservative thing to say is that's accepted by faith by evolutionists. That is not actually proven fact and we can give reasons why we don't find it believable. And maybe that's as far as we can go. But um, from an engineering standpoint, uh, and like I said, my professor in neuroscience that studied this, uh, um, people like us would be like, well, give us the details. So maybe to give a way of an analogy here is if you had a password, are you ever halfway logged in if you hit the wrong password? Does, it, does the computer say, oh, you're getting warm. You're getting warm. You got just a few more, you know, uh, just, just keep trying and just keep kind of changing the, 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 uh, the string that you typed in. And uh, 
if you if you don't get feedback like that, how is how is natural selection going to help construct this? It's it, that's the thing that I don't think that the other side appreciates until people like Michael Behe came along. And I try not to use the word irreducible complexity. It's kind of become a term of abuse, and it gets into a lot of times we'll get into definitions of what this what it actually means. But I just like to say, okay, if you need <clears throat> Uh, the evolutionists have to demonstrate theoretically and empirically that this is viable. So yes, maybe something can, um, what we say, co-opt uh, maybe part of the solution and say, okay, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. It's like someone out there might have a password that is similar to mine and he's, it's almost there. Does that mean I'm going to be able to, he's going to be able to solve my password because any system that has, that much sensitivity to change, it's like, you know, it may not get you where you think. And um, we could get even deeper into actually how many simultaneous changes are needed, because I, I looked at the uh, at the protein amino acid sequence of some of these channels, and I'm just like, yeah, in your dreams, <laughs> that you're going to get something similar to this, and you're going to be able to mutate it one at a time. It's like trying to make a stretch limousine. Um, you know, you're cutting it in half and then you just, it's like, oh, you've ended up making a, a non-functioning car in the process. That's what will probably happen. Now, I've tried to illustrate that with that channel. I said, just imagine trying to modify that. Uh, most of the most of what you'll do is hopefully not going to be damaging. And if it does make a substantial change in function, it's probably going to destroy it. And I've not gotten pushback from that. So it'd be interesting to see what the critics will respond to this. Because um, when I put this on the table, I've, I've not gotten any responses it's, it's similar to their response to the Tupo Isam race um, when we, I put that on the table. So that is an illustration. What I tried to illustrate here is they'll, they'll say, oh, we can modify this protein and it'll have different enzymatic function. I'll grant that. But there are definitely times we can make a change to a protein and it will have a new function. My point is you can't extrapolate that to systems like this. This system is what we call multimeric. And if we could show that video again, there's I'm gonna show um, I'm gonna show one section here. Oops, hang on, hang on. The My controls are so tiny. Four rigid protein loops, one control. Okay. This is a multimeric protein. What that means is it's actually not just one protein. It's actually four. The proper term is polypeptide. So when the gene expresses the potassium ion channel, it has to make four identical copies. And so in this video, she said it makes it's composed. This is made of four identical subunits. So when the, the gene for the potassium ion channel, what we call the K channel, because K is the symbol, chemical symbol for potassium. When that gene is translated, it has to make four identical copies uh, of the protein. Strictly speaking, I'll say polypeptide. Those polypeptides then have to fit together to make this complex. So this isn't expressed, it isn't like the gene is ex expressed once and it you have a potassium ion channel, it makes four, and somehow they're assembled to connect just right, just right. So it makes that hole in the center just the right size to sub angstrom, subatomic, not subatomic, uh, you know, uh, fractional radius of, a, of an ion, like say potassium. It has to be that precise. So you need so these aren't globs of Play-Doh that you can stick together in any way you want. Each one, each thing is like connected chemically. Is that Very precisely. It yeah. takes foresight. That's why I talked to this scientist whose name, who I will not name. And he said, yeah, this is what we call a multimeric protein. Multimeric, multi meaning many and meric meaning, you know, these, these, these uh, polymers, so these multiple polymers hooking together. The way you change the size of that hole, or even if the hole exists in the first place, 
is to change the spelling of the protein. So this isn't like when you know uh, you're in 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 Dad's workshop and he's milling things to make parts. Uh, he's using all these tools to shape it. The way you shape things for proteins is to spell them right, and then some other things with like uh, a chaperoning process, an assembly process, or whatever. But <laughs> so, so it takes spelling. The first level is spelling it right, what we call the primary structure. How do you know how to spell something so it's going to shape this way? This is why it's such a difficult problem. If I went to a protein engineer and said, okay, make something like this, you figure out how to spell the sequence and it's going to make this. He'd probably say, that's a real headache. I don't know that I could do it. We may not have the computational power. That's what I call the second protein. The first protein folding problem is you're given a sequence, figure out how it folds. The harder protein folding problem is let's try to make something this shape. See if you can actually spell something that will make that shape. I mean, you think you think our headaches and spelling is hard. This is a really tough spelling problem. And this is like, say, a, a, a sequence of a thousand. Each of those colored blobs there is about a thousand. And you have to spell it so that you can anticipate it's going to make, uh, when you make four of these, they're going to connect together like that. Just And that's not even the, I'll show you in, in another segment, we'll cover just how hard this is to, to stitch into that membrane, into that cell barrier. And so the point of this was how difficult is it to mutate? So I'll grant that we can have mutations in isolated enzymes and they'll give it a slightly different enzymatic function. Uh, you cannot extrapolate that to this situation. And you could take this down and I have one anecdote I wanna give. Many people know that uh, I've been a professional gambler. And what a professional gambler has to do is understand expected value. He has to know that uh, his rate of winning is enough to overcome his losses and that he can eventually take down the casino. Usually the casino will not allow you to do that because they'll kick you out before you can take all their money away. So uh, we call these skilled gamblers, advantage players, advantage players, because we play with our advantage. Now, the other, the unskilled gamblers we call ploppies, because they get into the uh, seat at the table or at the slot machine, and they just kind of plop down. So we call them ploppies. So you have two classes of gamblers. You have the players like me, and then you have the ploppies. The ploppies, um, <laughs> I know that sounds so derogatory. But that's from my casino days. They, some of them, it's really sad. They're very addicted to gambling, and they get that thrill out of winning occasionally. And so, in their mind, they focus on all the thrills of winning. They they erase in their minds all the agonies, the agonies of defeat. So, if you have enough substantial losses, it's going to negate all the gains. And the problem with evolutionary theory is they'll look at some of these isolated examples of a new functional improvement that's usually very trivial. They will, they'll forget about all the ones where it's disastrous. They wrongly assume that the disastrous or the compromise will be eliminated and it's, and it's, not, it's not necessarily eliminated. Sometimes it is if it's severe enough but these can accumulate. And, um, you know, it's, they, they never kind of do a, an analysis. It's like if, we, if we're making, if for every functional improvement we have 100 that are compromising, what's going to be the net result? And then you have to figure, it's a little bit more complex than that when you have to figure in like population sizes and all that. But we know from from laboratory and field observation that uh, a lot of times something that's actually good will be lost anyway. So the reason for that is something that's functionally good might be expensive to retain in terms of reproductive success. And I've talked about how like being a very intelligent woman, many of them do not have children. So in the evolutionary sense, uh, being smart is a would be a deleterious trait. 
whereas being not so smart is a beneficial trait. So what ends up happening is there's a there's a net selective pressure against um, maintaining intelligence. We're, we're getting dumber and dumber, and to quote a particular evolutionist who doesn't like me saying it, he said, "No, maybe the best thing for the human race is we get dumber and dumber until we all lose our minds." And he he resents me saying that and quoting him because it makes him look kind of stupid. But I'm like, you actually articulated the problem concisely that you know the evolutionary viewpoint is it's all about reproductive success it's not about functional improvement and that's rooted in the fact they don't like the teleological language because you clearly see it when you start to use teleological language so saying the word dumber and dumber versus intelligent is actually already starting to be teleological language because you're making value judgments based on functionality, not reproductive success. Wow. Yeah. So um, we're not seeing a path for how collective mutations could improve the ion channel. And we see very easy ways for the ion channel to be disrupted in a way that's destructive to the organism. Exactly. And what I would say, just to qualify a little bit, we don't see a way we could do this piecemeal, like the way Dawkins and Darwin envisioned, one little increment at a time. It has to be wholesale changes. So what would cause all these coordinated, coordinated mutations to suddenly happen that you take, like, say, that basic ion channel that we are showing and then make it a voltage gated, where it has now these mm -hmm. features where you could switch it off and on. Um, now, how many mutations, and I know you're probably like estimated how many mutations would that take to make a change like that? And I know you can't probably say an exact number, but I mean. I can't give it off the top of my head, but from the sizes, we can estimate just by looking at the sizes of uh, a plain vanilla ion channel and then a voltage gated ion channel, like say the potassium and my recollection is it's like on the order of a few hundred at least. And that's just in size changes. We're not even talking about sequence changes. In another show, I'll also show there's another difficulty. And that's, it's the, um, it's the stitching. It's the construction of it. It's the insertion into the, it's what we call translocation process. This has to be, there has to be codes in the, uh, it has, there have to be codes, quote unquote, quote unquote codes in the sequence that tell it how to construct, how to translocate it into the membrane. And, and that's, that's the subject of another show. So there's not just sensitivity in terms of the shape. There has, there's sensitivity in terms of the construction process that there, there, there has to be, there's almost like overlapping codes that you might say, so to speak. You have the code that gives it the final shape, but then you have codes that are intermediate that helps the machines construct it. Because it, it's kind of like when you have, uh, when you're assembling, if you, you know, assembling furniture or whatever, you might have little markers or things that kind of tell you how to do it. You know, this side here, this side there, this part there, this is how it's supposed to connect. So there are these embedded markers that tell the other machines that are constructing this complex how to build it and insert it in the cell. And that's like another code. So you, and there, there's a difficulty is like, you have to get it to do two things at once. And you have to conceive of this. This is like having to write a letter that has hidden messages in it. If you're gonna write say a paragraph and then you look like say all the letters, the way that they're, that you know, that they end each of the words and you take it, you can come up with these secret messages. And there's some examples of this. It's very difficult to build that. It's what we call polyconstrained. This system is polyconstrained at least on three levels that I could see. One, the construction code that has to be there. The other, that, that it's multimeric, so all these parts will connect. And then having the foresight to see that after it connects, it makes this functional channel. That's why wow. it would take genius of several orders of magnitude above anything we know on this planet to build that. 
And so when evolutionists will tell me natural selection can build it, I said, prove it. Because our smartest guys cannot build it. And Amazing. why would you think, yeah, why would you think random mutation and natural selection? I said, prove it. Why don't you try to build a potassium ion channel like this? Not some of these trivial, silly simulations where they're trying to evolve things and they're eliminating details. See, that's where a lot of these evolutionary simulations fail, where they say, oh, we simulated how this could evolve. I'm just like, yeah, right. Did you did you model it at the atomic level like this? So when they say we we showed how an eye could evolve, and I'm like, I, I want to say, yeah, right. Did you model the the proteins in the cellular processes that would have to evolve? I, I know the answer ahead of time. It's like, no, they obviously didn't. Because if, if you include those details, uh, it's like, Oh, gee, every intermediate step is kind of lethal. The showstopper, just like trying to type in a password and it's not giving you, oh, it's not really giving you that feedback to bring you closer to your goal. Yeah, well, Sal, I can see some people watching this and thinking, well, okay, maybe we don't know how that could have happened, but we have so much scientific evidence for evolution that we can just take it on faith that some of these difficult things like the ion channel happened. What do you think about that? Is the scientific evidence so great for evolution that these um, things that you're mentioning can be taken on faith? No, there might be. And, and see, this is where they play a rhetorical game when they mean by evolution, common descent. It's like, well, we can make, they can make, and I, I as one who doesn't accept evolution, uh, I will say that they actually have a good argument. I wouldn't say that it's right, but it's it's a it's a formidable arg argument for universal common ancestry. So they'll appeal to things like shared errors, um, pseudo genes, etc. And f for that, like you know, the, the way that we're able to do paternity tests is that the child will have the same shared errors with the parent and so they, they will say there's overwhelming evidence for universal common ancestry and i'll say okay let's just take that for granted that's not that's still not proof for the evolution of things like ion channels because these ion channels in quite a number of families of proteins and this is one thing that really tripped them up i'll say and you can ask any evolutionist this, I'll say, okay, you see that we have all these different kinds of proteins. You have proteins like the topoisomerase. You have proteins like the, the potassium ion channels or these acetylcholine channels or sodium channels, calcium channels. Then you have uh, zinc finger proteins and collagens, all these classes of proteins. Do all these and they're part of major protein families. Can you unify all these under, under a single family tree? That is to say, can you take, assume, assume for the sake of argument that there's common descent at the, you know, at the cellular level. How about at the protein level? Do all, do all existing genes, do they have a common ancestor, a single functional protein ancestor? they will say no. And that was very sobering. I, I said, I got them now. And they'll, I was actually surprised that they're saying, yeah, it's more like an orchard. They didn't, they wouldn't use that word, but that's essentially what's happening. It's like, you have these, you have a family that looks this way and a family that looks this way. And you put it through a computer and you can't do that trick. Like with the Maury show, it's like, uh, this one has a common ancestor. It's like, no, they're not even sisters, so to speak. And a lot of people object to the use term like machine when we're talking about proteins, but really that is what a protein is, right? It's like a very, it's an, it, these are incredible machines. That some, some proteins, some proteins, because some are proteins can be parts of machines. Proteins can be the raw material. Sometimes they're just purely structural, like collagens is an example. It's not necessarily machine. It's it's just there to to help hold you together. If you didn't have it, we we'd fall. If we didn't have it, we'd fall apart physically. 
um, so I, just a little nuance there. So, um, but they do resist when we talk about systems in biology, certain of them being machines, uh, because it does suggest it's engineered. So what are they going to call it? You know what? They're going to say, oh, this is how it's built. But we like to say this is how it's designed because it can it, it conveys something of, of the strength of the construction and the ingenuity, really. Even built implies <laughs> the need for a builder. Yes. That's a good one, Rebecca. It's so, impossible so, so, to avoid this teleological yeah, language. really is. I, I wonder if we're going to have um, ch certain people commenting on our on our video because you kept using this, and I know it's going to rub some people th the wrong way that we emphasize the, ma the machine metaphor, or you know the building or engineering metaphor. But just going back a little bit to common ancestry, if they say evolution is well established, I'll say, well, there are problems with it, but let's just do that as a given. It doesn't explain the origin of major protein families. And and I'm like, okay, you can't, it's what I call a non sequitur. You can't say, uh, like, let me give you an example of a non sequitur. A human and chimp are very similar. And if I said, therefore, the potassium ion channel evolved naturally, that just doesn't make sense. You can't, you can't infer that. The way you can infer that the potassium ion channel evolved by a process of mutation and differential reproductive success, which they improperly call natural selection, it's not. But let's just say it's a process of Darwinian selection or differential reproductive success. The way to establish that is to show in terms of biochemistry, cellular biology, and physics and mechanical principles that it's going to be natural from that. You start from that and you have to even figure out what the ancestor looks like and then say, okay, we mutate this ancestor and this is how it evolves. You can't take the fossil record and try to figure out how this evolved. So when they say there's overwhelming evidence, it's like not only do you have to accept it by faith, you have to, to do that, you have to use lots of non sequiturs like saying, oh, we had the fossil record, therefore it proves the potassium ion channel or any of these other ion channels evolved naturally. That's not the way to do it. And um, people that are studying this, like that scientist will go unnamed, realize that. It's like, you have to, you're invoking paleontology when this is a question of physics and statistics and mechanics. And it's just not gonna cut it. And, um, <laughs> you know, that's why we don't have some of these top research teams that are figuring out how the cell works. They don't have a lot of use for evolutionary biology because it doesn't explain anything. Well, thank you so much, Sal. Appreciate it. Well, that's all I had on this segment. And I don't know how oh, we've gone an hour. We were only supposed to go 10 minutes. Oh, well, we had a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. Thanks. Okay, I'm trying to stop the recording. Okay, I just, I, I think I...